Hi everyone, I am um, Suresh Patini. Uh, I work at Sony Interactive Entertainment, which is a maker of PlayStation. Uh, I started at PlayStation in 2012. Uh, when I joined 2012, uh, I was hired to join, work with a team of people to modernize the PlayStation network. Uh, we were uh, in charge and, uh, of um, bringing in new web and cloud technologies. Um, that was our goal in 2012. Uh, we accomplished that. Um, and in 2013, we, uh, my, my team and I led uh, the group to launch PlayStation 4. Uh, as you know, PlayStation 4 is uh, quite popular. Um, it's very good. It has done really well. Um, and since the launch, it has grown significantly and the scale and the number of customers and the engagement kept growing rapidly. Um, as, the num as the demand for the users and the console kept going up, uh, we had to invest a lot of time in uh, making the services that were powering the PlayStation ecosystem more resilient um, and available. So if we invested um, a lot in um, going to multiple regions within AWS um, cloud, uh, that was something that we accomplished in 2016. Um, and since 2016, uh, we've been uh, heavily focused on becoming a data-driven company. And 2018 is when we locked the, uh, unlocked the value of data within the company. Uh, and, and, and since we have uh, a lot of data, we leverage the data uh, to start investing in um, personalization, machine learning, and that's the those are the efforts that uh, we are working on right now, and we have delivered some of them, and we are continuing to invest in machine learning. Um, so, just to give you a snapshot of what PlayStation is about, uh, PlayStation Network um, has a lot of immersive gaming experiences. Uh, we have lots of games, 500 plus games that are available on PlayStation ecosystem. Um, you can you can play in single mode. You can play in multi mode. Um, on the storefront, um, you can you can browse, search, look at you know we can you can look at your personalized recommendations and and purchase games. Uh, we also have video capabilities where you can um, rent a video or buy a video. Um, you can also engage socially. You can find friends. You can um, engage in parties. Uh, you can do a lot of other community activities also on the ecosystem. And just to give you a high level uh, view of how where is PlayStation today, we have 103 million active users. We have uh, about 38.8 million PS Plus subscribers. Uh, and by the way, we are one of the top subscription businesses in the, in the world. Um, and we have generated um, revenue of about $21 billion in the last fiscal year. Uh, we also sold 5 million VR headsets. Um, speaking of personalization, uh, we, you know, the personalization journey involved three big stages. One was obviously getting all the data um, that we have in, 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 a, in, in a place that we could use it. Um, the second is about uh, what do we do with the data and how do we make sense of the data to understand our players and then the third is what did we do on the personalization? So I'm going to talk about each of these areas in, in, in this presentation. So before I talk about personalization, I wanted to give you a sense about um, the scale we are dealing with, right? We have hundreds of microservices delivering millions of requests per second. Uh, we collect 100 plus billion events per day. Uh, and then we have many database clusters and we are on multiple regions. So anything we do with personalization, um, we, it has to um, support um, the scale that we have. And you cannot leverage edge caching uh, like Akamai or um, CloudFront to, to, to solve these personalization problems because it, you know, everything has to be uh, specific to a user. So, so we have to think of the technologies that would help us with personalization. Right, from a data perspective, um, the, the challenges that we had, um, you know, when we started this data initiative in 2016, were like, uh, we had a lot of collect, we were collecting a lot of data. Every team that was involved um, in, in delivering some level of experiences or services um, had data. 
Um, the challenge that we had was they were all multiple data islands. Data was in there in different formats. Um, there was no single dictionary that would tell you what all data PlayStation had. Um, and then also uh, we were using data, uh, you know, in marketing and some aspects of end user personalization. But I feel like we, we, there was a lot of immaturity um, in, in terms of how we leverage data. So these were our challenges. Um, so when we looked at all that stuff, so we, instead of building a, a centralized data platform, we came up with a concept called um, data ocean. Um, and, and the principles behind data ocean are really to federate um, the data ownership, um, not to have a single owner of all data. So the team that creates or sources the data would own the data um, and and store it as um, data lakes uh, within their respective cloud accounts. Uh, the the only central thing that we we required was the catalog. Um, we called it the dictionary or the catalog, which kind of had information about where all the data is. Um, and we use two types of catalogs. We have uh, we're using AWS Lake Formation for the lakes catalog, and we also have Alation, which helps scientists understand uh, what all data sets we have, because you can augment data on top of what you have in the in the core catalog. And this is what we built, and and with this, what we could do is, you know, teams could come in and look at the data and enrich the data and create more data sets, which were uh, which are available for machine learning engineers to, to use these to personalize and deliver personalized experiences. And we could also use the same data sets for enterprise reporting to solve, to drive business results. Um, so from a personalization perspective, uh, we wanted to build um, aggregated curated data sets, which really um, talked about what the players are and chat segmented users, um, 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 segmented users by genre, by you know, spending patterns and various aspects, right? So we, so we had a lot of machine learning opportunities to at the data level itself, where we did a lot of offline uh, investments to curate the data to create um, audience segments by various dimensions. And we also, uh, you know, invested a lot in feature engineering to to generate attributes um, for each user. So that way, uh, you know, if you wanted to do a personalization campaign uh, for people who spend at least fifty dollars a month, uh, we had all those, um, you know, capabilities that uh, attributes that were generated for each users. And that's where uh, we spent a lot of time on machine learning. Uh, both in the offline and then at runtime, I'll, I'll talk about it a little later. And then, and, and then to, to enable this personalization where we invested in building a lightweight machine learning platform. Uh, think of this platform as, um, as, a, as a system that allowed uh, machine learning engineers to create their models, deploy their models, you know, run their models, ma run, uh, manage workflows uh, for their models to really help with training. And once, the, once there's adequate training and adequate uh, confidence in the, in the attribute and the features that they generated, we would push them to the prediction layer. And you can see the, the purple box is the runtime store. And that's the topic of today's talk that I'm talking about. Um, so, we, so, so I'll get to that in a second. So when it comes to feature store requirements, uh, we, we had some requirements in place, right? We we wanted a, a, a backend database store which can handle hundred plus millions of users, right? And we wanted we were looking for a store that can handle uh, several terabytes of data, um, and we we were generating attributes and features, hundred plus features per user. Uh, so we wanted a store that could handle the that that scale. And our data retrieval, um, you know, we had to make snap decisions at runtime um, at a scale of millions of requests per second. And, we, and our latency requirements were to be under 10 milliseconds. And we also wanted our total uh, personalization solution 
to have low cost, uh, total cost of ownership to be uh, to be reasonable, right? Um, so, and then we, we were looking at various database systems, and and one of the things that is, uh, you know, if you look at in early days uh, in traditional relational databases world, where you would you would vertically um, do your scaling by throwing in bigger and bigger hardware uh, um, at, at the problem. But with internet scale, the data volumes have grown exponentially and that's when distributed systems became popular. And when it comes to distributed systems, uh, one of the things that is quite popular with distributed systems is the CAP theorem, where um, and, and the, the, the CAP theorem, what it says is, um, you know, you have this consistency availability and, and partitioning, but when it comes to uh, distributed systems, you can't have all three, you can only have two out of three. Um, so if you look at it, the relational systems are very good with um, consistency and, and availability. Uh, whereas if you look at um, systems like HBase or MongoDB or Redis, they're good with consistency and partitioning. Um, and if you look at um, availability and partitioning, um, you know, the NoSQL systems come, in, come into play, right? Um, that doesn't mean the NoSQL systems like Cassandra, Aerospec, and Couchbase are not consistent, they're eventually consistent. So for us, uh, we felt scale is important, consistency is desired, but eventual consistency is fine, right? Um, so we chose, um, we, we decided that, you know, availability and partitioning is what we're looking for. And the candidates were Aerospike, Cassandra, and Couchbase, right? And how did we decide which one made sense for our personalization? So. We looked at various aspects of these database systems and don't get me wrong, all of these are great database systems, right? And we use Couchbase for some use cases, we use Cassandra for some use cases. Uh, so given the personalization scale um, um, uh, and, and the low latency requirements uh, that we had, um, we felt Aerospike's design of, um, you know, designing, their design is based on flash optimized in memory database uh, technology and which is what we felt like it could, it is a really good thing uh, for, for the use cases that we have. Uh, we also felt the, from our experience, the sharding, you know, all of them have automatic sharding, but I feel Aerospec sharding has been operationally um, the less um, uh, painful. Um, it's it's uh, almost uh, self-healing, uh, and from uh, operational overhead as well, uh, we we haven't had that many issues with uh, managing the the system. Total cost of ownership is, is pretty low because the, the a small cluster could handle um, several terabytes of data, um, and 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 based on all these things, we felt like uh, for our personalization use case, it, it, we chose Aerospike. Uh, and then from a personalization perspective, uh, we have a lot of opportunities within PlayStation ecosystem uh, when it comes to personalization. I mean, obviously recommending uh, games to, to players, games because they bought something is one, one avenue. Uh, we also do friend recommendations. We match people on multiplayer game um, capabilities where uh, we find people with similar skills and match them uh, based on various um, attributes um, and models that we have. And, and we also use machine learning for fraud detection. Um, so we have a lot of use cases. Um, our eventual goal is to make all experiences uh, and all games that users engage with um, uh, much more personalized and much more user centric. Right? With that, uh, I uh, thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Uh, and and by the way, uh, we are hiring great engineers. So if you are looking for an opportunity, um, hit me up on LinkedIn, and we can go from there. Thank you.